Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first set of Apes Notes for 2014. As you can probably guess from the words on the slide, we'll be talking about human population dynamics today. Basically, how the population of humans on the planet has changed throughout our history. There are several times where we'll be looking at graphs and various figures showing us the changes in the human population, but a couple of things that I want to point out first. There are four major periods in time, four major innovations that allowed for dramatic increases in the human population. In fact, one of the last ones, the Industrial Revolution, saw an extremely large exponential growth in the human population. So. First of all, when the first tools were being made, fire mastered, all of that, uh, spears, arrows, things for hunting, increased the food source and increased the population. The agricultural revolution, when humans first started settling down and deciding to farm, uh, gathering instead of just gathering seeds and hunting. The Industrial Revolution is the one that saw the huge increase in the population of humans, a lot of it due to improvements in medical technology and in um, sanitation, for one thing. And then, finally, the Green Revolution, which also increased the amount of food that could be grown on a given area of land. Apologies for the poor quality of this graph. I know it's a little fuzzy, um, but it's the best one that I've been able to find that gives you an idea of the dramatic increase we've had in the population of humans uh, over, say, the past 10,000 years, as you see in this graph. So what you'll notice, the y-axis is the population of people on the planet. The x-axis is time. The farthest point back is 10,000 BCE before the Common Era. Um, and you'll notice at various points, the population is labeled on the graph as well. So if you'll look, um, all the way up until about uh, 1800 or so, you had less than a billion people on the planet. And then all of a sudden, once that first billion was reached, you'll see it skyrockets after that. Took all of human history to get to one billion, and then it just took 130 years to add the next billion. And then you'll notice that was 1930. By 1960, we'd reached 3 billion. By 1975, 4 billion. By 1987, 5 billion. By 2000, there were 6 billion. And in 2012, we hit the 7 billion mark. So the population's growing very quickly. It seems like I'm trying to awe you with the spectacular increase that we've had in human population over the past several hundred years. You would be correct. What I have up here is a data table showing you a uh, time period and how long it took for the population to double. So for example, uh, the first one is 950 to 1600. That means between the years 950 and 1600, the population of people on the planet doubled. That doubling time was 650 years. If you look between 18, 1600 and 1800, then it took only 200 years to double the population. This decreased again from 1800 to 1925, where you had only 125 years to double the population. And then you'll notice the dramatic decrease goes even further to 1925 to 1975, where you once again doubled the population, this time in 50 years. However, 
Um, people started to notice a dramatic decrease in birth rates uh, in developed countries. And so you started having a slowing of this huge population growth. And so the doubling time remained the same from 1975 to 2025. Keep in mind that that is a projected number since obviously we haven't hit 2025 yet. Several set of slides that we're going to look at show a map of the world with a lot of red dots on them. We'll be looking at a similar video in class. What this shows is the distribution of people on the planet. So this graph right here, or this map right here, is showing in the year zero, the population of 300 million people, it shows you where they were mostly located. So each dot represents about a million people. Um, and basically in areas that are very sparsely populated, the dot will be kind of in the middle of the area that you're looking at. So if you'll notice the most dots are concentrated in China and India, which already had some of the higher population densities. Notice there are very large populations in those areas. You also see some large populations in the coastal areas of Europe as well. A thousand years later, you'll see a similar trend that India and China are once again heavily populated. You'll see some uh, population clusters in Europe. You start to see some other population clusters uh, growing in South America, in uh, Central America and Mexico, and also along the coasts of Africa. Um, so you start to see some population growth there. Forward another 800 years when we finally hit the 1 billion mark, and you'll notice Yes, of course, India and China still have huge populations, but you see an increasing population in Europe. Notice that's about the time of the Industrial Revolution, so it makes sense that you have increases in population in Europe where the Industrial Revolution first started. You also, if you look closely, start to see some dots showing up in North America. That would be the early United States. And then in Mexico, you start to see a, a larger gathering of dots. And you also see larger populations in certain areas of Africa where you had various empires. 127 years later, when we reached our second billion, um, the distribution, I'm going to stop mentioning India and China at this point, because you'll notice there are tons of people in India and China throughout the entire thing. Europe continues to fill up, but the big thing that you'll notice is that the United States and some areas of Canada are starting to acquire larger populations. Those population centers in Africa are also getting larger. And then you'll notice South America, especially the coast of Brazil and the west coast of South America are starting to get higher populations. Also notice the islands of Indonesia off the southeast coast of India and China are getting pretty heavily populated too. Another 33 years has passed and that adds the next billion uh, people on the planet. So trends continue. We're starting to fill up South America more. The United States is starting to fill up more. You can see some population centers in uh, the West Coast around California and the East Coast as well. Europe is, is filling up as well. You see some population centers growing uh, around the edges of Australia, in Madagascar, in South Africa, and also in Russia as well. It took just 14 years to add the next billion people. So the areas where you're seeing the most growth, you're not quite seeing a ton of growth in Europe anymore. It's basically pretty much like somebody colored it with a red marker. Um, but you're seeing larger population growth in Africa. You'll also, you're also seeing more population centers, more concentrations of people in North America, Mexico, and South America. Another 13 years, we added our next billion, so up to 5 billion people now, and the trends we noticed in the previous slides are continuing. Those areas which had growing population centers, they're continuing to fill up with people. Now if we take a look at 1999, you'll see, if we look at, say, the United States, you can see that most of the population seems to be concentrated around the East Coast both the northeast and the southeast, so like the Florida region. Uh, there's some around the Gulf Coast and then around the West Coast. Um, if you'll keep in mind our lessons when we were talking about the various biomes, notice places that have inhospitable biomes where it's difficult to live don't have a lot of people living in them. So there's a nice big empty spot in the Sahara. 
There is a large empty spot in the Amazon. There is a large empty spot in the western half of the United States where there's desert. Siberia is basically empty because that's all taiga, very cold. But the areas that are hospitable, you see lots and lots of people. At this point, both China and India had, if not reached 1 billion people each, um, uh, India was definitely approaching it at that point. Now this slide is speculation. With a uh, kind of moderate growth rate for the world, what population might we expect to see, say, in the year 2050? So some conservative estimates have put the population at 9 billion. I've heard estimates go as high as 15 billion. Hopefully we won't reach that. You'll notice it just kind of looks like somebody just started coloring in the map. Basically, people are filling up all the regions that they can. Um, one of the things I want to point out is that if all the dots that were being used to represent a million people would not fit along the edges, like along the coastline areas where they would actually be people living, they started putting them inland of that. So you may actually have higher population densities that aren't indicated on this map. So our dramatic announcement of the lesson the world's population officially reached 7 billion on about Halloween night of 2011. That, there's an estimate for the exact time that the, the 7 billionth baby was born based on an average how many people are born every minute. Um, but it's not like there's one kid out there who's like, you're 7 billion! Since then, the population has continued to grow. We're at about 7 point, I believe, 2 billion at this point. So we're already on our way to 8 billion. You want to know how I can possibly know our current world population. There are a lot of websites that you can look up the current population on. Based on the growth rate, based on uh, estimates of births per day, births per minute, deaths per day and per minute, etc. cetera. Uh, they've got a running count of the world's population. So what you see up here, if you look at the red box in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, that shows you the exact date and time that I um, basically uh, took a screenshot of my computer. What you can see is at that point, the population was 7.2 billion. If you go to that same website right now, the population will have already increased. Um, if you look, it's worldometers.info is the particular website I looked at, but all you have to do is put in a Google search uh, world population clock or world population count, and you'll have a bunch of websites pop up. Lots of good statistics on them, too. If this graph confuses you, don't worry. We're going to be looking at some pie charts on the following slides that will hopefully clarify this. So what this is, is it's showing by continent or region what percentage of the world's total population was found in that region. It doesn't have uh, any measurement of exactly how big the population was. So um, this kind of gives people some problems. So, for example, in 1750, 63% of the people on the planet lived in Asia. And if you'll look at Asia throughout the years, you'll see that that number grows a little for 1800, and then it starts becoming a smaller percentage all the way up until 1950. And this isn't saying that you had a decrease in the population of Asia. What happened is you had population explosions in other parts of the world where they had dramatic increases in population. So by comparison, Asia made up a smaller portion. Now, if you look, there are estimates up to 2050 and 2100, and you'll see that the continent that is going to have the largest population growth is going to start making up more and more of the total world population is Africa. And Africa does have higher growth rates than any of the other continents. Here we have the first of our pie charts. I basically took all the data from the previous slide, and I turned for each year, I turned it into a pie chart so you could see what percentage of the total world's population was found in each continent. Now, if you're looking at Oceania and trying to find it on the pie graph, it's not going to be easy to find. Oceania is Australia and the surrounding islands. It's not going to make up a really significant chunk of the human population. What I want you to pay attention to on the succeeding slides is Asia, Africa, and right now, Europe. North America will also start to see some population growth. Um, as will Latin America, but the dramatic differences right now will be happening in Europe and Asia. 
Notice I also have the total world population in that year listed at the bottom. So this is out of 791 million people, more than half of them were in Asia. By the time we reach 1800, where we're almost at our billion mark, you'll see that it looks like it's, it's edging on close to three quarters of the population is in Asia. Looks like there's a lot more of the population living in Asia. It could be that there were higher growth rates, or it could be that there were higher death rates in other parts of the world. So you'll see Europe is holding steady at about a quarter of the population. North America looks about, oh, I'm sorry, um, Africa looks about half of that. Sorry. Africa and North America look very similar on the key. And Latin America, North America, and Oceania make up a tiny sliver of the total population. Reach 1850, we've topped a billion. We still have a very large chunk of the population is Asian, but it looks like we've had a small increase in the percentage of the population that's in Europe. Africa is holding steady. Now you start to see some growth in the population percentages in Latin America and North America as well. 1900, you definitely see that Europe's population is, is starting to make up a larger percentage of the people on the planet. So in 1900, one out of every four of the 1.65 billion people on the planet lived in Europe. We still have more than half of the planet living in Asia, half of the human population. But keep in mind, Asia's huge, so you're always going to have a lot of the human population living there. Um, then you see Latin America and North America are starting to make up a larger percentage of the population. Africa is actually decreasing a little at this point. Doesn't mean the population didn't decrease. It just means, it doesn't mean the population decreased. It means that the population of uh, other areas probably increased more at that point. 1950, you can see out of the 2.53 billion people, uh, still half of them in Asia. It looks like there are less uh, less percentage of the world population is in Europe at this point. Why? Because you're starting to see more population growth in Latin America, North America, and in Africa as well. I want to point out that North America got a lot of its population increase basically from immigration, a lot of people moving in. That as well as a higher birth rate as well. Year 2000 with 6 billion people, uh, you see Asia really making a comeback. Um, Europe is now a much smaller portion of the world's population. Uh, Latin America has grown to uh, encompass more of the world's population than North America, and Africa is starting to grow again as to become a larger percentage of the world's population. Here's the first of our projections. The really large change that you'll see. Europe continues to shrink. Europe's population just isn't growing that fast, while there are other parts of the world who are having higher uh, growth rates, higher population growth rates. Most notably, you'll see that Africa is now starting to make up about a quarter of the world's population. So at that point, in approximately an estimated 9.31 billion people, one out of four of them will live in Africa. And a final projection here. For the year 2100, with an estimated population of 10.12 billion, so we've topped the 10 billion point, we finally see Asia starting to make up less than half of the total population of the world. And who's kind of picked up that slack? You'll see Africa, which is now going to have more than a quarter of the world's population. So what we'll end up seeing, China has already cur curtailed their population growth. India is on its way to doing that, the two most populous countries in the world. And population growth rates are declining throughout a lot of countries in Asia, even as we speak. But there are still higher growth rates in several African countries. And so that's going to lead to a larger percentage of the, of the population living in Africa, just because their population is going to increase more over the next 100 years. Don't worry, this isn't a glitch. What I'd like to do is run through each of these pie graphs, just throwing them up here for about five seconds on screen so you can start to see this progression. I'm not going to talk during it, so just hum some music to yourself while this is going on.
Now, wasn't that a nice break? None of that mystery lady yammering at you in the background. Uh, if that went by too fast for you, keep in mind, you do have control of this lesson. You can rewind and go back and watch it again. So here we see a graph showing the human population from 1950 and then showing estimates all the way up to 2050. You'll see it is divided up by a major area. So you have North America, Latin America, Europe, Asia, and Oceania, and you have Africa. A uh, big difference between this and the previous pie charts, they're just lumping the Australia area in with Asia. So those dotted lines that you see towards the top, they're labeled high fertility rate, medium fertility rate, low fertility rate. So this is depending on whether or not we have a decrease in the growth rate, whether the growth rate stays the same, or whether it's kind of in between. So the upper estimate, if everybody keeps having babies, a lot of babies. We could reach by 2050, 11.2 billion. Um, if people stop having children, if they go down to having just enough children to replace themselves in the population, we could end up at 7.7 .7 billion. But considering we're already at 7.2 billion, I don't think that's going to happen. So the medium estimate that a lot of people are using is 9.4 billion. So this graph may be a little more difficult to read. Let's take a closer look at the y-axis. The label on the y-axis is the stabilization ratio, or the number of births divided by the number of deaths. Keep in mind, if that number is 1, you'll have equal births and deaths, and your population's not really going to change. So notice that's also labeled on the graph 1 equals stable population in green down there. So the closer these lines are coming to the number 1, the closer we're getting to having no population growth. So you'll see developed countries, which are in that olive green color, are um, already at about a stable population, and they're actually projected to go below the, the stabilization ratio of one, which means you would see a decrease in the population of these areas. The developing countries, you will see that um, they, they still have higher birth rates, so there's still population growth happening there. But Asia is approaching the stabilization ratio of one uh, very rapidly, Central and South America as well. Africa is going to take longer to get to that. It's been a while since I've thrown in a vocabulary word, so here I'll throw two at you. Um, the two of them are replacement level fertility, which is RLF and total fertility rate, which is TFR. On the AP test, you can expect to have those thrown at you either as the full-on word like replacement level fertility or as an abbreviation. You may get questions that ask about RLF and TFR without stating what they are. So you do need to memorize those acronyms and what they stand for. Replacement level fertility is what I was talking about in class, having enough children just for a couple to replace themselves. I also mentioned that it's at 2.1 an average of 2.1 children per couple. Why? Because if everybody just had two children, some children may end up having diseases, may end up being born with birth defects, may not make it to reproductive age, and then there are always accidents. So that extra 0.1 is kind of like a buffer just in case uh, some members of the population die off before they reach reproductive age. Note, this is not a conscious decision. It's not like somebody's out there dictating, okay, every 10th couple is going to have three kids. This is just an average. You may have some people have no kids. You may have some people have four kids. Uh, the fertility rate tends to be higher in less developed countries. Um, and the total fertility rate is the average number of children that a woman's going to have in her lifetime. This can be anywhere from zero all the way up to large numbers like eight. Um, so this can vary depending on the country. Once again, where you have the more developed countries or the more um, economically developed countries, you tend to have lower total fertility rates. Apologies on this slide, guys. Um, I ended up finding more stuff that I wanted to put on this after I'd already sent your notes out to be printed. All the blue stuff needs to be written down. You can just pause on this slide, write everything down wherever you have space in your notes. So let's talk about this. We'll notice that a lot of these factors that affect fertility rate have to do with women. Uh, whether they're educated, whether they have equal rights, uh, that makes a very big difference in the number of, uh, number of children a woman will have in her lifetime. Uh, other factors that are 
besides the point of women and their rights, degree of urbanization, if you have a lot of people living in cities, you tend to have smaller families. Social and religious beliefs can also uh, make a large difference. The one that comes most readily to mind is um, Catholicism has a ban on birth control. And so in countries that are primarily Catholic, you would expect to have higher fertility rates if people are following religious practices. Governments can also influence how many children a, a family has, either by encouraging certain size families or by more dictating it, as we'll, we'll talk about with the one-child policy of China. Economic status can also have an effect. There's actually um, information that shows that the higher the poverty level, the more children a couple will have. This is especially true in rural areas where the children, once they're able to walk, are actually able to help out on the farm or if they're in a very poor areas where the, the family is making their money by begging on the streets, the children can be sent out to get money as well. So having more children means you have a larger income for the family. Also in general, the earlier you tend to get married, the more children you'll have and access to healthcare and family planning services can make a difference in the total number of children a couple will have as well graph shows the total fertility rates by country as of 2011, so it's fairly recent data. I want you to notice that everything that is from the light green all the way to the blue colors, all of those are fertility rates of three and under. So that means in those countries, the average woman is having three or less children. You'll notice that, um, for example, Canada has a fertility rate of one or less. Brazil does as well. We'll talk about Brazil later. China does as well, one child policy. Um, countries that have two to three children per couple or per woman on average, United States, Mexico, India, northern countries in Africa, South Africa. And if we look for those areas that have higher um higher fertility rates. You'll notice a lot of them are concentrated in Africa, which is why um, they're going to experience the most population growth in the next hundred years. Wondering why there are such high fertility rates in Africa? As we start to talk about some of these factors that affect fertility rate, uh, think about countries in Africa. Generally, they tend to be on the less economically developed end, and you'll find that that makes a difference in the fertility rate. There's also political instability, which can lead to disruptions in uh, health services, governmental services, which means there's not really a, uh, an effective access to family planning services. And there's also a high infant mortality rate. Um, a lot of these things end up leading to higher birth rates, which is why you have the higher fertility rates. Just in case you were missing all the graphs, this is showing the fertility rate as it's decreasing or changing in general in countries around the world. So there's an emphasis on developing and developed countries and also on Asia, South and Central America and Africa. Asia, large percentage of the population still experiencing some growth. Africa going to experience the most growth in the next hundred or so years. So that's why those are emphasized. Notice the developed world is actually in, in some cases having less than two children per woman. So that means that those populations may actually start declining. And as soon as all of these uh, countries end up reaching 2.1 as the um, total fertility rate, then we'll end up at RLF or replacement level fertility, and we should see a pretty stable world population. Before we go any further, I need to teach y'all how to read a specific type of diagram that's very important that you will see on your AP test that we'll be talking about in class. This is an age structure diagram. The y-axis of this graph is generally located in the middle, and it measures age in years. Uh, it may not have specific numeric labels, but I'm sure you can tell the higher you go away from the x-axis, obviously the older the individual you're talking about. x-axis is most often a measurement of the percentage of the population. There are some age structure diagrams where you won't see percentage of the population you'll see an actual count, like millions of individuals. So make sure that whenever you encounter one of these diagrams, you read the label on the x-axis. I'd like you to notice that to the left of the y-axis, notice the numbers don't become negative. 
you can't really talk about a negative percent of a population. So all of the numbers we're dealing with are going to be positive values. This may become more clear as we start to look at what you see in an age structure diagram. You will have a label of some sort, but in general, the rule of thumb is everything to the left of the y-axis represents males in the population. We begin to look at each of these specific bars that are graphed. Each bar represents the percentage of the population that falls in that age group for that gender. So the yellow highlighted bar that you see here represents the part of the population that is made up of boys between the ages of 0 and 15. And if you read on the x-axis, that's 10% of the population. So the total population, 10% are boys from 0 to 15. Next bar up just shows you that 8% of the total population of this country or region is made up of males between the ages of 15 and 30. And you can read the rest of the bars yourself. I hope this seems fairly obvious, but if the males are on the left side of the y-axis, then the females are on the right side of the y-axis. I want to point out that you don't necessarily see an age structure diagram being completely symmetrical. You can have some areas where you have more males than females. So obviously you would have a higher percentage of your population being males. You can also have the reverse true with you having a higher percentage of females in certain age groups or overall. Same principle applies. Each bar represents the percentage of the population that you'll find um, in that area in that gender. So this highlighted yellow bar says that 10% of the total population is females between the age of 0 and 15. If we put both sides together, we end up with a complete age structure diagram. I would like to point out for those of you who like to point out my mistakes that technically when you add up all of the percentages for all of the age groups for both genders, you should end up with 100% of the population. I didn't, and once I realized that, I just didn't think it was important enough to go back and change it. Stop torturing me. Okay, back to the lesson. What we have here are three kind of characteristic types of age structure diagrams. The one on the far left says rapid growth at the top, and that's because that's the type of age structure diagram you'll see in a country that's experiencing rapid growth still. So the examples listed here are Kenya, Nigeria, and Saudi Arabia. Notice that you don't have labels on the y-axis. It's labeled at the bottom. All of the blue bars are going to be ages 0 to 14. All of the gray bars are between 15 and 44. And then all of the purple bars are ages 45 and higher. If you look at the middle diagram, you'll see a slow growth country. Notice the base is less wide. You don't have as much of your population in the younger, er younger stages. That means you don't have a lot of individuals who are going to start reproducing and adding to the population soon. Uh, those are countries like Australia, Canada, and ourselves, the U.S. If you're looking at zero growth, countries like Austria, Denmark, Italy, and a lot of countries in Europe and also Japan as well, they have zero growth. Notice you have the uh, population pretty spread out amongst all the different age groups. You don't have a very wide base, so you're not going to see a lot of reproduction in the near future. Uh, something that we will talk about for quite a little bit. The demographic transition model is something that social scientists and economists and population scientists looked at. They were noticing trends in countries and they were noticing these distinct stages where you would have typical birth rates, death rates, and you would see certain population growth rates. Um, we're gonna look at this in more detail. This slide is just an overview. We're also gonna look at some graphs of the birth and death rate and total population growth. Now, there are four distinct stages of the demographic transition model, and it's basically revolving around industrialization or when each country has its own version of the industrial revolution. Starts out with pre-industrial, where you have both high birth and high death rates. Um, you may have a very high birth rate, but since the death rate is so high, you don't have much population growth. Notice that as 
medical quality, medical care increases in quality, and the food supply increases, you have lower death rates. And in stage two, the transitional stage, you have lower death rates, but your birth rate remains high until stage three. Between stages two and three, that's where you're going to have your largest area of population growth. And that's where a majority of the planet has been for the past couple hundred years, which is why we've seen an explosion in growth. Uh, a goal for a lot of countries is to reach stage four with zero population growth. So you have a stable population. So I'm sorry, but um, I decided to add more detail for each of the stages of the demographic transition model after I had sent your notes off to be copied. So this is stuff that's not included in your notes. As I said before, you can write it down. You can pause the video, uh, whatever you feel is best. So we're going to talk about the reasons for the high birth rate first. Um, sorry, that was my cat saying hello. Um, so reasons for the high birth rate. There's not a lot of birth control available. Um, there's also a high infant mortality rate. A lot of children are dying perhaps before their first birthday. Um, the thought is that couples are, are reasoning or feeling that um, out of the children they have, maybe half of them will survive to adulthood. So I better have twice as many children as I want to end up with. And then children are often seen as a future source of income. And they are a lot of times able to work, help support the family, especially if, for example, you were living on a farm, you were living in an area that didn't have any sort of child labor laws. Um, in some poorer areas, you can have the children go out and actually uh, beg for money to help contribute to the family. So from the time they walk, they're an asset and they're helping support the whole family. You won't see a very large population growth at this point, though, because there's a high death rate as well. There is poorer medical facilities, so you'll have higher incidence of disease, especially not helped by the fact that you may not have as high levels of hygiene as you might otherwise have. There's also malnutrition, starvation, things of that nature that are going to contribute to the high death rate. Look at the age structure diagram here. This is typical of countries that are in the pre-industrial stage of the demographic transition model. Notice it's the rapid growth um, version of an age structure diagram. So if you have a decrease in the death rate, that population can increase dramatically. You don't see any difference between this age structure diagram and the one for stage one. I'll wait a second while you rewind and compare the two. Now that you've done that, you should see that there's a much more dramatic difference between the base of the age structure diagram and the higher levels in stage one. Here, things are starting to kind of even out. Um, you have a lower death rate, so you're going to start to see more members of the population at those higher ages, around 65 or higher. And some of the reasons why you have lower death rates is because there's improved quality of medicine, public health, you have less children dying off young, and you also have better nutrition. So also decreases the, the death rate, everyone's got enough to eat. So some of the countries, and this is not a complete list by far, uh, that are currently in this stage of the demographic transition model are Nepal, Afghanistan, Yemen, Bhutan, Laos, a lot of sub-Saharan Africa, although th there is an exception, South Africa is going to be um, an another stage. There isn't necessarily a huge difference between the age structure diagram you would see for stage two and stage three industrial, so I didn't include one here. Here, you start to have a decrease in the birth rate, which means the base of your pyramid is going to start shrinking. Um, you'll have uh, reasons for this. You have preferences for smaller families. Why? Because children are expensive. And so the more kids you have, the more money you have to pay for them. There may be a, a change in the social trend, so it may not be fashionable to have a lot of kids. Whereas there may have been peer pressure or um, cultural pressure to have lots of children in previous times. Um, there's also what's listed here is the rise in materialism. Basically, instead of spending a lot of money on these kids and their diapers and their toys and their cars and their college, um, I'd rather buy that nice big TV instead. And then also the lower infant mortality rate. You know every single child that you give birth to is going to survive to adulthood. Okay, have as many children as you want to have, not twice as many. Some of the countries that are in this stage 
Um, they're listed there. You'll see a lot of them are in Central America, some in South America, some out in the Pacific Ocean, like the Philippines and Indonesia. You have Turkey, Egypt, Algeria. Those are in the Mediterranean area, South Africa, India, um, and the list goes on. There's actually a much larger list. If you're curious, you can always look it up online. Page four is where you start to see zero population growth. This is where you have a low birth rate and a low death rate. So you don't have a lot of growth going on. Uh, your fertility rate is going to keep falling. And in some cases, it can fall below replacement level. Um, this is due to also some changes in personal lifestyle. A lot of times in these stage four countries, you're going to have a lot more women in the workforce. Um, when women are in the workforce, they'll often choose to delay childbearing in favor of school and, and um, kind of working their way up in their chosen career. And so since they start having children later, they tend to have less kids total. So a lot of Europe is in this category, the United States, Canada, Argentina and Australia. You've got some of the countries in the Caribbean, like the Bahamas. Puerto Rico is technically a part of the United States. Brazil, South Korea, Iran, and China. So I'd like to point out that on the original chart that I showed you with stages of the demographic transition model, there was no stage five, there was no stage six. These are kind of theoretical or hypothetical stages. You'll see stage five, there are some countries that are thought to be entering stage five if they aren't already there. Um, but I have been able to find very little information on a potential stage six. So in stage five, your death rate is going to climb higher than your birth rate, which means you're going to see a decrease in the population. You can see that on the age structure diagram because you see there are less individuals under 15 years of age than there are in the kind of prime reproductive age between 15 and say, you know, 35, 40. So that means you're going to have less individuals who are going to be reproducing and adding to the population. In general, you should expect to see a decrease in the population for countries with that kind of age structure diagram. Um, there are a number of reasons listed for the low birth rate. Um, most of them are, are things that we've already covered with factors that affect total fertility rate or things that decrease the birth rate in stage three of the demographic transition model. Only one thing wasn't stated there, which is an increase in non-traditional lifestyles. You don't necessarily have everybody following the, the old plan of you're going to have a, a family with a mom and a dad and two kids. You might have people who choose to remain single for their entire lives. You also have homosexual couples who are not going to necessarily be adding uh, a lot of members to the population as well. So that can also factor into the lower birth rate. Now, the little information I've been able to see that references a stage six says uh, there could be an increase in the population. I haven't been able to find much information on it. Um, so I don't know why there could be an increase in population. Only time will tell. And just in case you were missing uh, lots of graphs, you know, something besides age structure diagrams. Uh, here is a graph showing the birth rate, crude death rate, the total population in stages one through four of the demographic transition model. I particularly like this graph because it also includes projections for what you might see in a stage five country. I want to point out there are two Y axes on this graph. The left one shows you the crude death rate and the right one shows you the crude birth rate. I also want to point out they have different scales. So the line that represents 25 births, I mean, 25 deaths per 1,000 is, is at the exact same spot as the line representing 40 births per 1,000. Um, if you look during stage one and stage four, you'll notice the birth rate and the death rate are very similar to each other. These are times when you're not going to see much population growth, if any at all. So if you look at the total population, which we don't have an axis for, um, you can see that it doesn't change much in stage one and stage four. In stage two and stage three, you'll notice that large gap between the birth rate and the death rate. That represents all the individuals you are adding to the population. So if we look at stage five, you'll notice that those are projected changes. So notice the total population is decreasing slightly, and that's because if you'll look at the bottom, the death rate is increasing. Um, over the birth rate. So you're going to start seeing a decline in the population. I'm often asked, even though we've been successful in reducing the, the total global uh, population growth, why do we still have so many people being added to the population? 
And the reason for that is there's such a thing as population momentum. There's still population growth, even if you could immediately decrease the levels of um, the fertility rate down to replacement level. Uh, the reason is, I mean, frankly, it, let's say that you're adding a billion people to the population. Um, if each of those billion people is having a child, that means that you're going to add another billion people to the population. It takes a while for the actual population to kind of catch up with the fact that you're just not adding um, increasing numbers of, of people to the population. So when you have a TFR in a country that's greater than 2.1, that's going to be an increase in the population. If the TFR, the total fertility rate, is less than 2.1, then you're going to have a decline in the population. The end stage of the demographic transition model and something that we're starting to see in more countries nowadays is zero population growth, also known as ZPG. Yes, you do need to know that acronym and what it stands for. This is the point at which your birth rate equals your death rate and you're not having an increase or decrease in the population. Now, in natural populations out in the wild, this will tend to happen when you have uh, the population approach the carrying capacity. However, it's very hard to measure the carrying capacity of the planet for humans. Why? Because just when we think we have too many people, we have the ability to develop technology that allows the same amount of land to support more people. Um, and then also, it's really difficult to figure out the carrying capacity of an area until you overshoot it and you start having more deaths than births. Now, many European countries have zero population growth. In fact, a lot of European countries would start seeing a decline in their population if it weren't for immigration. But this causes its own problems because you do sometimes have, you know, how we have the immigration issue here in the United States. Well, there's immigration issues in Europe as well, especially because um, you start to see more of the population being made up of immigrants than the natives. So, like I said, I've seen some estimates that are as high as us reaching a population of 15 billion by like 2050, 2075. How do we avoid that? There are several things that can be done to decrease the population growth rate in a country. We'll go over those on the following slides. Three major things that are three major factors that will decrease the population growth rate of an area. There's uh, an economic uh, human rights issue, and then there's also health care. So first of all, you can reduce poverty and increase primary education. So make sure that everybody has at least a grade school education, if nothing else, up to like the equivalent of grade six or grade eight. Um, number two, you can elevate the status of women, make sure that they have equal rights to those of men so they're able to help make a decision um, about whether how many children that they would like to have. And then finally, encourage family planning. So um, instead of just having children as they happen, uh, plan for them. You want to have this many children. This is how many you can support. So these are the steps to take uh, to make sure that those are the number of children we have, which goes hand in hand with reproductive health care. It can actually be unhealthy for a woman to carry child after child after child. That's why... Um, Several hundred years ago, a lot of women would die in childbirth because they were just having children constantly. It does produce some wear and tear on a woman's body. So if um, you encourage reproductive health, that also involves um, health care uh, for the mother and also for the child, reduces infant mortality rate too. So health care is an important factor. So the reason why economic development is important is because when countries are going through this demographic transition model, um, the, the natural social changes that happen, the changes that happen as a result of economic development, for example, increased urbanization, so more people moving to cities, um, having like standardized education and things like that, tend to encourage decreases in birth rates. And that's going to decrease uh, the population growth. Um, countries that are in those later stages, three and four of the demographic transition model, are also going to have, tend to have uh, higher levels of health care, better medicine quality, and they're also going to have lower infant mortality rates. There are a number of factors that tend to reduce the TFR, their total fertility rate, of women. Uh, generally, the higher level of education a woman has, the less children they're likely to have. If they are able to control their own fertility, meaning they have the right to say, no, I'm not going to have any more children, 
they'll tend to limit the number of children. If they have their own income, so they're not reliant upon, um, for, for example, a husband or um, a family member to support them, and therefore they have the freedom to limit the number of children they have. And also if they live in societies which grant them equal rights. So for example, what I have up here is in 2008, it says the government of Afghanistan passed a law that allows a man to withhold food from his wife if she refuses to have sex with him, also forbids a woman from going out of her home without her husband's permission. So if a woman is unable to leave her home, um, then she's not able to perhaps find a better situation or a different situation. And um, if you have a law like the one that we just named, obviously chances are good that you're you're going to have more children. Um, if you end up finding out that this is completely false and the government of Afghanistan did not pass such a law, just know that there are places where women are treated um, in such a manner where it makes it very difficult for them to limit the number of children they have. And if so, then I will apologize to the entire country of Afghanistan. I, I know this may come across as kind of a, a women's rights um, feminist sort of set of slides, but just for an example, women do about two thirds of all the hours worked, but they only get about 10% of the world's income. They own less than 10, less than 2% of the world's land. And they're 70% of the uh, poverty, the people under the poverty line, and 64% of the illiterate adults on the planet. So there's definitely still discrepancies in the uh, treatment of women in the world. So let's talk about education and women. Now, if you look at kind of mainstream society over the past however many hundreds of years, education has sometimes been said to be the domain of men only. Um, this has a uh, has improved a lot over the years, but there are still about 900 million girls who should be attending elementary school who are not. Um, these girls could not be attending just because it, it could be a societal view that um, a woman's place is in the home, the girl needs to learn how to uh, do domestic chores rather than um, waste time going to school. There could be a matter of um, the family being poor, not being able to send, um, send their daughters to school. Um, because there are a lot of parts of the world where they don't have free education. Hint, hint, be grateful. Um, and uh, there are statistics that show that uh, a woman who um, has not been educated, who cannot read, may have an average of five to seven children. And this is compared to the average of about two children in societies where most of the women can read. So you do see a definite effect on the total fertility rate. A lot of nonprofit organizations, and there are actually governments that are involved in providing family planning services. Uh, this al allows uh, couples to decide how many children they're going to have, um, try to decide are they going to space them out, or are they going to have them one after the other, um, so they can make plans. They can also make sure they have the resources to support them. Uh, a lot of them also will give information on the health aspects of spacing out your births, not having child after child, um, birth control to make sure that in the intervening time when you're you're trying to not have another child that you make sure you don't and then health care is often really uh important it's provided for both the pregnant women and infants which is important in reducing infant mortality um, because of this there's been a decrease not only in the birth rate but also in the number of abortions performed per year and also of the number of mothers and fetuses that are dying before a, a woman gives birth and um it, it can also be seen as an investment for every dollar that's spent on family planning, it does save a lot of money in um, uh, other costs, things like education, health costs, and social services that have to deal with unwanted births. So, for example, children are abandoned or given up for adoption. A few more statistics about family planning that I thought were interesting. There is a large number, there are several hundred million couples in less developed countries who would like to have access to this information and don't. Um, and if, uh, according to this study by the UN Population Fund, if you were able to uh, provide family planning services for people uh, around the world, it could prevent 52 million unwanted pregnancies, 22 million abortions, 1.4 million infant deaths, and 142,000 pregnancy-related deaths. And that in and of itself is, is enough to reduce the kind of average um, 
estimate for the global population in 2050 by a billion people. So that could be 1 billion less people on the planet. And it would only cost about $20 per couple per year. So everybody go and donate some money or maybe write letters to Bill and Melinda Gates. Countries uh, have tried various methods to reduce their population growth, and they've tried different methods with different amounts of success. We're going to focus right now in this lesson on China and India, two countries whose populations have topped 1 billion. There are also some cultural similarities that affect um, efforts to control population, and we're going to look at their successes and their failures. Please keep in mind that in class, we will discuss these further, and we'll probably also look at a couple of other countries and their methods for decreasing birth rate as well. China and India have a number of things in common. Both countries have limits to the natural resources they have, and they're both seeing a dramatic increase in the percentage of their population that's in their middle class. They also, both governments, have been working on this uh, population issue for over 50 years, and in both countries, there's a cultural bias for sons instead of daughters. China is very famous for its one-child policy. Um, there are a lot of very strong incentives given to couples to have only one child. They get access to better housing, more food. They get free health care. Um, they can get bonuses in their salary. They can also get um, better job opportunities for their child if they have only one. There is also... Um, a, a fine imposed if you have a second child or more. Um, because of this, China has seen a dramatic decrease in their growth rate. Um, now about 86% of couples use birth control in some form, and their growth rate has dropped dramatically in 50 years, from 2.79% down to 0.47%. Now, I have heard that there have been some changes to the one-child policy in recent years. For example, if you are an only child and your spouse is an only child, you can have two children, um... This is probably because they would like to make sure that their population doesn't decrease due, too dramatically. And one of the things we'll look at when we watch China's Lost Girls is um, the cultural bias for sons has led to a lot of daughters being abandoned. Uh, and so there's now uh, an imbalance. There's more males in certain generations than there are females. So allowing couples to have more than one child could encourage more to have two kids and make sure that they have a girl, if they have a girl to keep it. I apologize for the fuzziness of these images. Um, let me go ahead and explain some details to y'all. The x-axis is not in percentage of the population, it's population in millions. Um, the top diagram is for the year 2000, and just as we talked about, the left-hand side of the diagram is uh, showing the males in the population. The right-hand side is showing the females in the population. So you'll notice, even as far as, as of 2000, you still have a very broad base to this population pyramid. That means that you are going to have a lot more members entering reproductive age in the next 10, 20 years. And you start to see that... In, uh, in 2035, which is the image on the bottom left, uh, you see that you, you have this larger population at each age range. But if you'll notice, the base is no longer wider than the top levels. So that's the decrease in population that you see as a result of China's one-child policy. And you can see this more when you look at the bottom right-hand figure, which is a, a possible age structure diagram in 2050 that this is starting to look a lot more like that typical zero population growth age structure diagram that we saw earlier in the notes. So India has um, some differences in their population control policy. One thing to keep in mind is that uh, China is a communist country where the government has more control over aspects of people's lives, whereas India is a democracy, um, which comes with you know, the similar things that we have in our democracy here. If the government passed a law, you could have protests, you could have, um, you could call for re-elections to re-elect your representatives to get ones who agree with your opinion. So while the government has had encouragement of family planning, um, the success rate is not as high. 
Um, first of all, there's a high poverty level, especially in, in villages and rural areas, and that encourages people to have more children. Once again, there is a cultural bias for sons. So for example, if your first two children are daughters, um, that would make it more likely for a couple, especially um, out of the city, out in the villages and rural areas, to have uh, a third or even a fourth child in an attempt to have a son. So only 48% of couples use some form of birth control in India. And um, there has been a decrease in the growth rate. So their growth rate has gone down from 2.37 to 1.37 in 40 years. Um, however, it's not quite enough. There will be a time in your lifetime where India's population surpasses China's. We see age structure diagrams that are very um Similar, they come from the same source as the Chinese ones that we looked at in a couple of slides ago. So the top is the year 2000. Notice there is a very wide base. Um, if you want to go back and look at the Chinese age structure diagram, you'll see that in uh, China's in 2000, their um, base of the population pyramid has started to level off. But in India, it's still expanding. Um, if you look at the 2035, graph you'll see that that starts to look kind of like the age structure diagram in the year 2000 for China and then if you'll look at the 2050 um, there isn't a, a lot of expansion so you are starting to hit population stabilization but you'll see that kind of bulge in, in the middle ages where you have a large segment of the population though you do see when you look at the base you do start to see less individuals in the younger ages. So hopefully that will lead to a decrease in population. All right, guys, that's the end. Hope you enjoyed the notes and I'll uh, see you around in class and you'll hear me around whenever I get the next set of notes up. Good night.